And so, hi everybody and welcome to our Q&A with director and writer Cesar Diaz from Nuestros Madres, Our Mothers. I'm Robert Rosenberg and I'm a filmmaker as well and I also work with Outsider Pictures, the distributor of the film. Um, I'm assuming there might be some people on here who didn't see the film yet, so we're going to try to be cautious about revealing any spoilers for the film that would matter. Um, and if you haven't seen the film and you want to see the film, understand that this is a virtual cinema release, which is it's a premiere in the United States, and the tickets, the virtual tickets, can be bought through local art houses around the country, and it's basically a key to watch the film online streaming at home, like Cesar is sitting in his empty virtual theater over there in Guatemala. Um, and you can go to outsiderpictures.us for a full list of the theaters and you click on the link and you go there and you, you can purchase it there. Um, and please tell all your friends about it. Also, you can follow us on social media, at least our Facebook uh, handle is at Outsider Pictures and that has the information as well. And the virtual cinema process supports these local art houses who are all closed now due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is a strategy to get these alternative art house foreign films out to the public because when, in a time when the theaters themselves are not open and you might wanna watch something other than Netflix, who we all love, but other than Netflix. And just to remind people, if you don't already know from your Zoom experience, if you want to uh, ask questions, you do it through the Q&A little um, icon at the bottom, a, a box will pop open, not through the chat box. We're reading the Q&A box. So I will, uh, we'll talk for a little while and then if there are questions coming through, we'll also share some of those questions with a Cesar. Um, so a big welcome again to Cesar. This is a film won the Camera, the Camera Dior uh, Prize among many others at the Cannes Film Festival. And um, this really is its big US theatrical premiere. So we're excited to be hosting with Outsider Pictures. Welcome Cesar. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me and uh, for being there in this uh, Q&A, virtual Q&A. Definitely. So um, I'm going to kind of, we did, we did one of these yesterday, so I'm going to shake up the questions a little bit today so it doesn't get stale. So I'm actually going to start with a question that we ended with last time to completely reverse it, which is, it's interesting, this is a film about Guatemala and, and goes deeply into Guatemalan history from the last 40 or 50 years without giving you a lot of facts in terms of context, if you didn't already know that history. And um, you make no excuse for, let's say, a US audience. If you're from Guatemala, you probably have enough basic facts. But if you're not, you might not. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> but Maybe not. Maybe not. But all, clearly, all most, most people in the United States are, you know, besides the migrant crisis and Guatemalans coming across the border, they're not really aware of that story. So um, I want to ask you about that choice to not be didactic and give a lot of facts slipped into your narrative, but also are there things now you'd like to say a little bit of introduction about the context of the civil war and the massacres and the disappearance and the sort of, and the commissions and the trials that are going on today? Yeah, actually it was a huge discussion all over the, 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 the writing process also, because I was uh, writing it with a French and Belgian producer, you know, exchanging point of views and then uh, in, a, in, a, in a European context. So at, at some point, uh, people need like a, a little note or even at some point, I think that the, the script has a little, a little text at the beginning saying like Guatemala um, has been through 36 years of civil war and then uh, dictatorship after dictatorship and then there's uh, 200,000 deaths and 4,500,000 uh, missing people. But, uh, and, and, and we try it actually, even in, even in the editing room. And um, I remember uh, a, a phrase of a colleague that told me, you are not here to uh, make a history lesson. You are here to make movies and if people want to know more they have to do their homework and doing their, their own research I mean you are not only opening doors for this knowledge and then people have, have to go deeper and then 
work a little bit. But, or at least Wikipedia. At least, at, at least, yeah, at, at least Wikipedia. But uh, the, 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 fact, the, the fact is that now in this, in this U.S. context uh, and this mig Guatemala migrant crisis, I think it's important for the U.S. audience to understand that people are not leaving the country because they, because they want to leave the country. They are escaping from, from, from something. And this something, which is the, 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 the violent context and this uh, unjust con con condition and then the inequality and then all, all those things that Guatemala is living on right now are the heritage of the world, of course. And it was there before that. I mean, uh, if you imagine that in, in 54, uh, the, the, the CIA black operation put in place a dictator in, in Guatemala to take down a democratic government that has been trying to reform and you know, trying to bring some justice and social security and all, all, all stuff, you can, you can understand a little bit the context and then under, understand better this Guatemalan migrant crisis um, trying to empathize with them and trying to understand that, that as I said, they're, they're, they're not leaving because they want to leave the country. They are leaving because they're, 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 they're escaping from something. Well, it's, it's interesting that you talk about the little sort of, you could have had a crawl or a little, you know, something yeah. on screen explaining things. And I could see how that would work contextually, especially for an audience in the United States. But I also understand your film is a beautiful, nuanced, kind of delicate, unusually delicate film about such a painful and intense historical moment. And we kind of clash with that. It would work fine in a documentary, and most documentaries might very well do that. If you're going to see testimony from witnesses, you have some, whether it's a narrator or an expert or a little crawl gives you some information, but I see why you didn't do it here. Which brings me to my question, your background or some of the stuff you've done as, as director has really been documentary, though you've worked most famously as an editor on um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's kind of, no, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of which was the, the big Guatemala film a few years ago. Um, what ways did you choose, why did you choose to make this film as a narrative, as a fictional film instead of as a documentary on the same subject? And why, how did you do things differently in terms of like the painterly elements of the film and the ways you didn't reveal things, okay? Uh, the, the, the thing is, I, I, I imagine a feature film because I have like, I, I have like, I dream, I dream some scenes and I, I, I really want to explore this mother-son relationship and I want to, and uh, I mean, for the people that, watch the movie for example the 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 the, the, the beach scene i uh, i have it from the from the very beginning and i really want to have this uh this scene and this uh, this metaphor uh, about the, the relationship and, um, and about the past and um, i think i didn't find the documentary narrative tools to do it um because and also because I really want to make a, a movie about a generation trapped in the in, into this uh, heritage of social struggle and, uh, and like this generation that didn't have to fight or didn't fought the the, the, the war but live with the, with the consequences and um, this this I. I yeah, I think I didn't find I, I didn't find this this documentary tools, narrative tools. But still I want to have this very strong connection with reality. And this is why I uh, I try to I, I film in the, in real places, I I cast real people, I bring the victims to the to the film and uh, because I wanted to be part of that. And then all this reality, I think it's, that makes the, the film richer. And, uh, and this mix of reality and, and, and fiction, I think that works very well. And then in, in 
this tiny, tiny line is going to, to disappear at some point, I think. Between the two, the two genres. Between the document. Actually, somebody, it's, it, uh, I just realized someone asked almost that exact same question. So thank you, Kyle, for asking that question. I, I asked it on my own. But um, I also, we talked about yesterday how lots of the film, there's definitely painterly elements in, in terms of composition in ways that you think, well, I could see someone making sort of a more, it's not, it's, it's a terrible comparison, but like Battle of Algiers, you know, these films that are almost look like documentaries, almost like Verite, very, you know, always handheld. And yet you did stuff where the compositions were just beautiful in the countryside of the bones at the very yeah. beginning of the film, which come back again. And I'm assuming that was a conscious choice not to be overly, you know, overly picky with your details, but to definitely create some stuff that was beautiful in Guatemala, even about the death. So, can you talk about that? Yeah, well, I, I was trying. I, I was trying to make an, like, an artistic gesture, of course, and I was trying to um, have this uh, making this whole world, and this world has some rules and rules about color and uh, about how it looks, and then how which is the distance with the, with 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 the, with the characters and which is the distance with the with the, with, with the things and how to make the characters live in, in this in, the, in in this context and and, and of course everything was uh, was true and i mean there's no um, improvisation there everything was true sometimes the things that happen inside the scenes was improvisation because there was real, real life people. I mean, or not professional actors that brings their own, their own personal stories, and then they mix up the dialogues, and then we don't care, and then we keep, keep shooting, and then, and 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 actually, I choose it because of this personality, also, you know. Um, but I think I was also trying to make an historical document because I think. During the during the war, we don't have much images to to build this um, collective imaginary. And then, if you if I told you about uh, Shoah, for example, or that I I, I said uh, Second World War, immediately you have images. Immediately you have this uh, this these images about the Shoah also. But the the problem in Guatemala is you know when you said the the civil war, we don't have this this kind of images. And so I was trying to to to, to build this the, this imaginary collective imaginary with us, and also because we're talking about real bones, real victims, uh, real places, and you have to be um, respectful, respectful, and at the same time uh, have this artistic gesture and create an aesthetic. Uh, about it and, and how and dialogue with this and it was a real good experience with the DOP and the our director to to build this 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 dialogue actually. You're reminding me of questions I didn't get to ask last time, so I wanted to clarify something again without giving anything away because it's very very much at the beginning of the film. The bones you see of the victims being reconstructed are the actual bones of people who've been unearthed or were props. Actually, um, we'll be, uh, we have You don't one... have to answer if you don't want to. Yeah, that no, 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 of course. There's not, no, there's not a secret there. Um, actually, we have uh, one skeleton that we built based uh, with the help with the, of, the, of the foundation, uh, based on uh, the colors and all the textures of the real bones. And because of, you have to understand that all these bones are evidence and our actual evidence. So we are not allowed to touch it. We are not allowed to, to move it. So the, the thing is, uh, all the people that you see in the foundation in the, in, during these scenes are real people from the foundation that are manipulating this evidence, their, these bones. And they help us to train Armando to uh, teach him how to touch it, how to put it, how to how to build a, a, a skeleton? He spent so many time there, uh, but yeah, we have the bones that actors manipulate are or skeleton. The, the other all other bones are real ones. 
Um, I just was curious from last night. So uh, also you spoke about, um, you kind of alluded to the fact that m actually most of the actors in the film are non-professional actors, except for your two leads, the mother, Emma, and the son, Armando, um, and that you allowed improvisation or even ways that they diverge from the script if they work to stay in there. But I also read this wonderful interview, I'm not sure with you or with Armando, where when you were casting them and they, they, they played up off against each other, we won't reveal what was going on in the scene because it reveals too much, but in that beach scene that it seemed like they were improvising a little bit to the scene and you use that in the script. Is that a misunderstanding? That's yes, correct. Yes, yeah. Actually, uh, I, I read a, a scene and trying to have this metaphor and not revealing the thing, but uh, trying to understand knowing that he knows something that she don't want to tell just to but um, armando and emma start to, to 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 do this improvisation and they did it in, in, in i mean best than, than than i wrote i didn't in, in a very they they imagined something else and it was amazing and i said okay you know what we will write down exactly what you said and then this will be the scene uh, because uh, it wasn't good enough and they just transformed it into something amazing. Well, it's a beautiful scene, but talk about, um, you know, watching the movie, I try, not, I, 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 I try not to read too much about the film, even if I'm going to be interviewing you later on and read about it afterwards. So I come to the film fresh and of course, watching it, you kind of wonder all these women in the rural countryside, these older women who are giving testimony and are witnesses to massacres and, and to the loss of their own husbands and, and, and family members, you kind of guess that they might really be those real people, but you're not really sure watching it. It just seemed preposterous that they weren't, but also preposterous that, that they were. So can you talk about, again, there's a fine line between the stories they're telling in your fiction and what their stories are and how you played off against those two ideas. Yeah, that actually, actually, they are real victims in, in, in this real village. And I wanted to in, involve the people uh, of the village to the, to the film. And we did it in, in many different ways, like in, the, in a production way or uh, extras. And, and, and they were, um, they were the, the, the first one when I, when, when, I, when I get there that start telling me their story about how the army came and then how they killed their husbands and then how they raped them and then how uh, the massacre happened. And um, I really want to have them in, in, in the film. And uh, I was actually, th this scene was written during the scouting uh, because I, I, at the beginning, I wanted to have them with, the, with their own testimony on sound and uh, and that didn't work in the in the, in the editing room, and then I recreate a massacre in sound also, and it was unbearable. I mean, you, it, it was too much for the audience, I think, and too much for the audience at this point of the film, because after this it will be very hard to to, to take you again up in this in this emotional curve. Um, and then the silence came, and then we tried with with silence, and it didn't work either because uh, you don't know how to do it because you have this rupture in the in the language. And then the music came, and then that how the music came to the film because we made it like that makes some coherence. But for me, it was very important to have the village and to have this reality uh, invading the the, the film. Uh, because uh, I, I I think I want not to to honor these these women. I want to honor also this the strength and this uh, looking for justice that they are they are doing. Yeah. Um, but just want to remind people: if you want to ask a question that we're going to actually see, you should try to put it into the Q and A box and not into the chat box, because if it goes in the chat box it's being sort of directed to me third hand and I'm not necessarily getting that. 
but I have a question from Paul in Los Angeles who okay. wants to know, um, actually there's a question I was gonna ask about the fact that you cast two Mexican actors as your lead. I kind of talk about why, and then also talk about how did the rest of the Guatemalan elenco, how did the cast, the people you're working with, respond to having two Mexicans in the lead? Actually, at the, at the, at the very beginning, I wanted to have only non-professional actors. And I started casting in the foundation and then in the human rights organizations and then uh, in the theater and then in the, in the, in the movies. And then I, I opened it uh, like an open casting during a week in a, in a national theater. And after 500 people, uh, I didn't find the right person. So I decided to read the script again and then I realized that the characters were was so so builded. I mean, there were so many emotions and there were so many scenes that they have really to to do like an actor work, uh, an acting work. And then uh, I decided to go to Mexico not only because this is the main industry in the region, but also in a historical uh, context most of the Guatemalans that, that went to exile during the civil war went to Mexico. And then, uh, I mean, my, me, I, I went to Mexico for 12 years and I speak like a Mexican, Guatemala, and most of my friends speak like Mexicans. And, and, and I think this, that, that tells you something immediately about the people that you are dealing with. I mean, if you, or for example, right now there's, something else that it's happening uh, in, in, in this, just to remind this migrant, Guatemala migrant crisis. There's some people from Guatemala that are coming back and being deported and they speak uh, Spanish with an American accent, which is because they, they were there for so many years uh, speaking, Spanish, speaking English that when they speak Spanish, of course they, they speak with this American accent. Because uh, I don't want to fake the accent of the characters. I mean, I didn't want to ask Armando to uh, speak like Guatemalan because at some point that will be very fake. And also because I wanted to, uh, there's also a statement for the Guatemalan audience. I mean, when they hear it, they will under com immediately understand which is the context of the characters. And this is why I went there. And then for, I mean, for the, for the, the, the Guatemalan crew, on the Guatemalan cast, it was very clear that that what we, what kind of character they were dealing with, because they are used to when you, as I said, when you see someone with with this accent, you understand. Um, you you refer to your spending ten or twelve years in Mexico in exile from Guatemala uh, after or during the Civil War period. Can you talk a little bit about your own personal story and what inspiration or in what ways that was a basis for the film that you made? Yeah, but, um, I, I went there because my mother was a gorilla fighter and then uh, she cannot be in Guatemala anymore. So she went there and my father was a, a missing person. So, he 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 wasn't there from even found very very near from when I was born, so uh, I never met him. And then so uh, this is the reason I I mean this is the first reason I want to make the movie. This not not an, an autobiographical movie, but just this feeling or this make me understand better the characters. I'm and and writing in a, in, a, in a deeper way, I think. I think you, I, I always try to have this the fiction distance to treat the characters as, as characters, not like, like I was doing a film about myself. I, I don't think this is interesting. Uh, yeah, this is why I went to Mexico because I cannot be in Guatemala anymore at some point. No, I mean, I, it's sort of, I guess people probably watch it. It's so, it's such a personal film, and yeah, of course, a very political film. But and it's so much enmeshes you in Guatemala that it's always the first question you wonder: 
is this film in some ways based on the director's life? Why did they write that? You know, it's not necessarily the case. I just want to say I got a couple of comments, people saying I, I, maybe they're understanding that there's the accents and the context better than I did listening to it, that they found that the Mexican accents of the two leads, the mother and the son, immediately transports you into knowing that they were in exile and they've come back and they understood that. So that works as a signal to people who know that context, it wouldn't work for most. I mean, I speak Spanish and I still can't quite grasp that subtlety of the accents. But um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, I mean, a more production question, this film not only won the Camador Award at Cannes, but was Belgium's uh, submission for the newly named International Oscar this year, the old foreign language Oscar. And people want to understand, I didn't understand when I first approached this, it's Belgium and the guy seems like he's Hispanic and what's the story? So can you tell the story of you, your Belgium, the film? Uh, actually, after after Mexico, I went to, to study in Belgium and I spent there like 20 years of my life. So after a few years, I became a Belgian citizen, and then I started working in the Belgian industry and the French industry because I were very close. And then, um, actually, our mothers is my uh, fine. I'm mean, it's it my thesis in the in the in my master degrees at uh, Fenis in in France. So I start. I always I wrote I, I wrote down this script in French for 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 a very long time, and the. Uh, the first Spanish version was very was late, late when we started working with a with a with a, produ a co producer in Guatemala. Um, and um, the fact is that Guatemala in Guatemala there is no film fund or film support or uh, no fin financial aid uh, from from the state or from 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 the private. So. Um, when I start developing the, the film with my Belgian producer, uh, we realized that if we did it, if we did it in a in a, in a only Guatemalan way, we will never make it. So we decided to make it like a Belgian movie, which means we need to, like a Belgian crew, and uh, it was not hard because uh, I wanted to work with our very close friends and the people that I know for a very long time that read the script, like very many versions of the script, and then they have notes, and then they, they, they have this uh, vision of the film with me. And um, I, it was a, a huge challenge to convince the Belgian Film Commission to say like, okay, you know what? This film is, <laughs> is going to be shot in Guatemala in Spanish, but it's going to be a Belgian film. And uh, after, um, uh, a while they they understand and they accept it um i mean they they have reason because after after i mean the history give, gave us reason and um, when they after after they can and camarador and everything uh, they have to choose which was the best film to represent belgium they choose nuestras madres and i think um, i think it's for me it's an important message also uh, because I think in, in Europe, we are living like this nationalism uh, 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 growing. And then uh, the fact that a migrant like me, uh, it's represented in Belgium with a film in Spanish. It's, it's important for, for, I think it's important for the Belgian society <laughs> because that opened a door for other people that understand that uh, you can be a, a citizen, but that doesn't mean that you have to forget your own past. And then you don't have to uh, melt in, 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 in the, with, with the others. With the others. We you, I mean, you, you have uh, obligations, responsibilities, rights, but you have also uh, something to say about it, and um, this is this is why I was very pleased that they choose Nuestras Madres to represent Belgium. <laughs> we have a couple more questions, and then we'll we'll wrap it. Um, I asked you this last night. Um, Ernesto, the son, is kind of like what we would call colloquially in the United States, kind of a righteous dude. You know, he like he believes in a he believes in in ideals. He's a good man. He's a millennial. He's a good man. You don't see a lot of rough edges except for his struggle with his own personal 
uh, past and history in his family. And I, I feel like you set him up as a counterpoint to the way that what you're showing in Guatemala, the tremendous divisions and oppressions for women with, you know, women, how women are treated, indigenous people are treated, poor people are treated, people in the countryside. And yet he's, in some ways, he's your classic Hollywood hero, troubled, but in, in today. Um, and what I'm wondering is, how much does he represent a new generation of Guatemalans? How much of that idealism is there, those aspirations to creating a better society? What's going on today? I think for, for my generation, it is important. For my generation that, that, here, that, that the, we irritate this, this, this past and this uh, looking for justice and then struggling for, for, for transform the society. And then, f f I mean, I think for, for me and my people of my age, it is important. And I think the new generation, the millennial, millennial generation, they really, I, I don't, 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 I think they don't care much about it. And they, they, and this is why I think Mistress Madres is important to have this dialogue with them uh, about, about the past and then try to understand that if you don't heal and then you don't uh, bring justice right now, you could never transform or, or get a new, a new society. Uh, like the history doesn't, no, doesn't begin with you. And this is the, the, like the millennial point of view. And, um, and uh, there's, there's something else that it's, uh, it's important in Guatemala that, that there are some people that are uh, denying all the genocide and they are denying that, uh, the, the, the things that happened and they are saying like, okay, the, the, the numbers of that, it's true, but it was the guerrilla fighters uh, with uh, military uniforms and they, they were, I mean, history that I, I want to go into. But this is also important uh, that uh, Nuestras Madres has to be shown in Guatemala, how this dialogue uh, about, 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 about the story, how to, how to, how to, to, to go further. Uh, this is, I think it, it's very important for, for us to have this dialogue. Right what has now. not been shown yet in Guatemala? Can you explain what happened? Actually, actually, actually it, it was to, well, we were supposed to open on the 19th of March in a huge event, and then the national release, and then the the, the tournée in the in the in the countryside. But the um, coronavirus uh, came, and then everything was uh, canceled. So we are waiting for to, to have a new new date. We are thinking about doing the same thing, like doing this virtual release because we are not sure that people in a few months, they will be, uh, they will feel safety about going in a national theater with 2000 people. So we're thinking to do this uh, virtual release also. Um, having this, this using this, uh, these tools. The thing is in, in Guatemala, I think to, to reach uh, not everyone has this internet connection, and not not anyone has um, the opportunity to, to 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 get access to it. So yeah, we need to think about a way to release the film in, in the coronavirus time or context. So we have a question from um, An Anabal, who is says he's friends with I guess friends of yours, Salvador Diaz in Luz Maria Bendiciones. I don't know. Thank you. Okay. But they're asking uh, when it will be available on DVD, which I guess the answer is not yet, since we're still just really <laughs> no, no, I, we're 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 that, like we have a plan before coronavirus. We have like a plan to, okay, after the the national release, we will get the DVD and then. Uh, but right now, I can't tell you. I'm I'm sorry, but I can't tell you I, I, because I don't know. Uh, we're just imagine how to how to release the film, in in this in this context, but. Uh, uh, because because releasing the film without having these conversations and then without having this dialogue, I think it's it's a shame. Uh, we are missing the opportunity to uh, to get people together and then to get people together, even if they don't, they are not agree. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I'm sorry, but I don't know. But actually, I'm sorry, I, I should have said that because Outsider Pictures has the North American rights and we're doing this virtual theatrical cinema release now, 
we will have the DVD and other uh, ways of seeing the film later on in the fall so that will become available. So if you are want this is to nice. know about that, you should become a, a follower of us on Facebook at, at, at Outsider Pictures or go to our website and subscribe to our emails, outsiderpictures.us. The final question from the audience, from Kyle, he wants to know, what are you doing for planning on your next film or what will your next film be? I am planning a film about a mother-son relationship in Brussels in French. And then I am, I am writing it right now. So this is, I think this is going to be my next project. Before, before that, I, uh, I, I wanted to make, um, an, I want to adapt a novel, a uh, Guatemala novel, which is uh, Los Jueces, The Judges from Arnoldo Galvez. But I think it's a, it's a bigger, it's a, it's a bigger film. And then I want to continue exploring this, this, this relationship, this mother-son relationship. And then I want to go for, for something more because the, the, the judges is like a, a whole neighborhood trying to get justice. And then there's a lot of extras. And then it, there's, there's some very much complicated film. So I want to go first of all, you know, in, 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 in other, few characters film and then I will go there. <laughs> well, fantastic. We at Outsider Pictures hope that we will be having your films in the future. Please, please. We, please. So uh, uh, thanks everybody for coming and being with us here today at Cesar. Thank you. This, thank, thank you very much. virtual applause since we can see the rest of the audience and please uh, go tell your friends, friends about the film. Small films like this, art house cinemas like this, it's word of mouth more than anything else. So if you like the film, you enjoyed this conversation, let your friends know. It'll certainly be up all week on the, for the, at those theaters and probably for some weeks to come through the virtual cinema release. Taser, thank, thank you very you. much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.